The issue isn't whether students are willing to enroll, but what they are willing to pay for that enrollment. Whether schools are entirely online or allowing students back on campus using social distancing rules, in both cases the activities of the students that don't allow for social distancing, like traditional dining, team sports, many club activities, large classes, performances, parties, etc., will all have to be scaled back or eliminated. This isn't going to be okay with students, not just because they enjoy them, but because those are the things that made them decide to attend and pay for a residential college in the first place. In my recent book, Risk and Reward, How Small Colleges Get Better Against the Odds, I talked about the college experience as something distinct from the credentialing that students take with them when they leave and the learning that goes along with that credential. The facilities arms race that we have seen in higher education for the last three decades or so is really mostly about that college experience component. New sports stadiums, elaborate dorms that mimic high-end apartments, rock climbing walls, gourmet coffee shops. None of those things are about student learning, of course. There isn't a professional educator on this planet that would say our students aren't learning enough and the most impactful thing we could do to address that problem is to build a coffee shop. It's not really a question of whether these things have value. They do. The real issue for me is that they don't substantially contribute to learning, but in the end, the students still have to pay for them. That means that a greater and greater share of what a student pays for to go to college is something that's not directly related to education and is more about the experience that students have while they're in college. What I said in my book about this was that students are paying at least as much for the experience they're having while they're in college as they are paying for the education and credentials they receive from having gone to college. Let me digress for a moment and show you a brochure that my high school junior daughter received in the mail just yesterday. She gets stuff like this nearly every day, so to be fair, I'm just going to pick the most recent one. This one is from Missouri State University, which by the way is a very fine school, but they obviously know how to talk to prospective students. In red, bold typeface, it states, Springfield has amenities. On this side, it talks about shopping, sports, and recreation. Maybe the other side talks about education. Nope. It just asks, when you go to college, what kind of city would you like to experience? Then it talks about the city of Springfield. Actually, the college, let alone the educational components, is never specifically mentioned at all on either side. When I say that students are paying at least as much for the experience they're having while they're in college as they are paying for the education and credentials they receive from having gone to college, it turns out that the truth of this statement is perfectly demonstrated by what we see unfolding during the coronavirus pandemic. Colleges are discovering that students are not going to pay for a college experience they're not going to get. At least, they're not going to pay for it without a fight. There are certainly students who have legitimate gripes about the quality of the distance education they're receiving. Not all teachers are optimally effective in that environment, but I think that most teachers are ultimately going to be effective teaching in that format. Some were already effective before this started, and teachers are certainly getting a lot of experience themselves in this format, and plenty of them will get immediately and noticeably better at it, having gone through a spring and a summer teaching online and so they have that experience under their belt. And also, with regard to the fall, they have the experience an opportunity to get ready, much more of an opportunity than they had in the spring. So while it would be better if there were a variety of teaching formats that teachers could choose from, and that students could choose based on their own learning styles, I do think that most teachers are going to be effective at teaching most students, even if most of the classes are online. The real issue is the college experience, which is a generic phrase that I take to encompass everything that a student doesn't get to experience when they're not on campus in person. The students don't get to enjoy the amenities of the campus. They don't get to have the social opportunities that they have under normal circumstances. And if they're stuck at home with mom and dad, and if one of the defining characteristics of the college experience was that you finally got to leave home, then the student isn't going to be very happy about that either. 
What all of this means is that students are discovering just how much they're paying for the other elements of college besides the educational part. And they're pushing back on the idea that they should pay this big pile of money as if nothing has really changed. Because something has changed. They're not getting what they paid for. And they're not really even getting the thing that caused them to choose that particular school in the first place. Because besides distinctive or flagship academic programs that do legitimately draw students, most of the other things that differentiate one school from another are the amenities, the facilities, the setting. Teaching predominantly online is sort of a force that strips away most of the trappings of a school and exposes very directly the educational portion of what the school is providing and invites scrutiny from students about whether that portion is worth the total cost of attendance. Schools need to subject themselves to that same scrutiny. I appreciate your questions, and I hope this information was helpful to you. I hope you're safe and healthy, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week.